So first of all, like, can you introduce yourself for the audience? Sure. Um, so my name is Dr. Amy Bender. I'm the um, clinical director of sleep science at Cerebra. I'm also an adjunct assistant professor of kinesiology at University of Calgary. And I've been in the sleep field for about 16 years now. I started off as a sleep technologist and then um, ended up doing a master's and PhD in experimental psychology, focusing on sleep, the um, response of brain waves to sleep deprivation and cognition, and then made my way up to Canada to do a postdoc at the University of Calgary, where I was focused on uh, optimizing sleep in Canadian Olympic athletes, and have since um, <clears throat> kind of worked with a number of different types of athletes, college, recreational, even um, Olympic level and professional. So uh, currently I'm full-time at Cerebra, where we're really trying to change the way we diagnose and treat sleep disorders uh, with our technology. Cool. So you mentioned that you work with tons of athletes. <laughs> So for, for no matter for athlete or for ordinary people, why is sleeping so important? It's really important for overall, like mental health, overall physical health, and then even for performance as well. So all of those are important for even the everyday person. But when we talk about the performance element, obviously athletes are more, um, it's kind of a more important element because you could miss the podium by, you know, milliseconds. So uh, that's why I think it's of interest to athletes in particular is the performance element. And I think that we need to speak that language in order to really get our athletes to buy into sleep optimization tools. Um, as far as like, we want to go into more detail as to what it can do, especially for an athlete. I always present on the performance element. So we have with more sleep, we see reduced reaction time. We see faster sprint times. We see better sport specific skills. We see better free throw percentage, better field goal percentage when we get more sleep, better tennis serving accuracy, uh, better time trial performance, you know, a cycling and stuff. So uh, performance is a key point for athletes. Um, but then we have kind of the mental health aspects as well. So mood is the number one performance factor affected by sleep deprivation. So when you look at all of the different studies, um, mood is something that pops out every single time. And we kind of know that anecdotally as well. Um, and then, and, and that relates to mental health too. Um, and then we have physical health. So hormone optimization. So when we sleep, we release growth hormone, we release testosterone, um, cortisol is regulated somewhat by sleep and reducing stress, et cetera. Uh, so all of those are important factors, I think for an athlete. Um, nutrition is another element. So when we're sleep deprived, we consume more calories, we consume more fatty foods, snacks, you know. Um, so yeah, those are kind of the main factors. Uh, one more, if I can add one more in, um, sleep optimization helps reduce injury risk as well. And there's been some work, a lot of work related to that uh, in relation to sleep um, duration. So how much sleep you're getting and how that relates to greater risk for injury. So, so as an adult, we want to get between seven and nine, uh, for, if you're working with teenagers between eight and 10 school age, between nine and 11. And we think athletes need more sleep than that as well. So, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, sleep duration can be related to injury risk as well. So <clears throat> you mentioned that sleep's going to affect a lot of like mental health, mood, or like reaction time, sprinting time, all kinds of stuff. So 
And you also mentioned that as an adult, we probably should sleep like six to nine hours per day. But what if that, that there's tons of things we need to address that we don't really able to like have like six hours of sleep during the night? Yeah, um, so, so it's, you wanna hit that minimum seven hours actually. So it makes it even harder to um, adjust that and hit that mark. Um, so there's a lot of things. I think number one, we need to educate the importance of sleep so that people realize how important it is so that we can start prioritizing it. Um, of course, that's easier said than done. Um, so many habits and health habits are hard to change. Um, but I think that's the first step is, is getting people to realize the importance of it. Um, and then we definitely want to get checked for sleep disorders. So sleep disorders can prevent you from getting that minimum seven hours that you need. And so we would want to, uh, for example, I helped develop the athlete sleep screening questionnaire and it's freely available. Maybe we can put a link in the show notes, but um, coaches can go there, practitioners can go there. They can send this link to their athletes and then, um, you know, our, and actually, I actually validated uh, the ASSQ in Chinese athletes as well. So we have that translation um, so I can, I can get you that. But uh, screening athletes for sleep problems is important because you don't really know, does this athlete have a problem or not? So this questionnaire can help with that um, because insomnia might prevent you. So the inability to fall asleep or stay asleep can prevent you from meeting that minimum mark. Um, other sleep disorders like sleep apnea. So if you, if you wake up, stopping breathing in the middle of the night or you're snoring a lot that can be related to sleep apnea which we'd want to get checked out and treated um so those are those are the sleep disorders can prevent you but then also just lack of prioritization so i think if we can educate about the importance and how it impacts your everyday life hopefully that can lead to some behavior change strategies Cool. So can, can we dive a little bit deeper into like a sleep disorder you mentioned? Like, is there a certain like uh, benchmark you need to reach that is like, so I can know that my athletes have like sleep disorder or like how many, like how many, like, or is there like minimal sleep time for a week if you didn't reach that, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard because people vary so much. There's a lot of inter or in inner individual differences, so differences between people. Um, and so it is hard to, that's why that range is so large, you know, it's, and how useful is that? I don't know, but I think because it, there's just so much variability between people you may need seven hours, I may need eight. Um, and so it's, it's kind of challenging to figure that out. Um, but I would say, you know, want to hit that minimum amount. And then what happens when we're getting more? Do we see, do we see a benefit in our performance objectively? The research tends to show that yes. So in college basketball players, they they were getting 6.7 hours of sleep per night. And then they told them to extend their sleep to 10 hours in bed. And they looked at their performance, what, you know, what they were doing when they were getting six and a half versus what they were doing when they were getting eight and a half. And the differences were striking. So you may think that you're performing fine on six hours, but when we extend that sleep, when we bank that sleep, when we get more sleep, the results show you perform much better. So um, that's something to keep in mind. And I think another thing to keep in mind 
a lot of people say, oh, I'm probably just a short sleeper. I can get by on very little sleep. I'm, you know, genetically programmed. I don't need a lot of sleep. But when we look at the research, it's only about 1% of the population can get by on six hours or less and not have any performance deficits. Um, and another thing that happened, so I worked at a sleep deprivation lab and we would sleep deprive people for 62 hours. Uh, so two full nights without sleep. And we would see that you know, performance would vary across the day because we have that circadian rhythm. So it wasn't like, um, you know, got worse, 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 the more hours they were awake, there was a little bit of variability because of that circadian rhythm. But um, what we found was that people were reporting their performance to be pretty good when in reality, we were looking at the performance and they were having lapses of attention, they were having slow reaction time. So there's kind of a disconnect between how you think you're performing and how you really are performing when you are sleep deprived. Cool. So is there a way to help like help athlete to like sleep better? Uh -oh. Yeah, absolutely. There's a number of different strategies to help. Um, I think number one is that education piece. So really letting them know why sleep is important, how it can impact their performance, how it can impact their health. Um, those key, you know, getting, if you're working with an adult athlete, between, you know, more like eight to 10, even though um, the recommendation for an adult is seven to nine. So that's something we wanna talk about. It's also about the quality of the sleep as well. It's not just about the duration. So there's a number, number of strategies we can do to improve the quality, um, putting away the electronic devices, um, getting lots of light in the morning, having a good pre-sleep routine, um, strategies to sleep better on the road, that kind of thing. So we want to educate about those types of um, op optimization strategies for athletes. And then we want to screen the athletes. So that's another strategy to identify those athletes who have a sleep problem with the athlete sleep screening questionnaire, for example. And then um, napping is another key strategy. So a lot of athletes don't necessarily take advantage of napping and it's a way to accumulate sleep across the week. I know you were kind of asking that question. Um, we can, of course, we want to keep our sleep schedule as regular as possible. That's very difficult as an athlete. You know, generally my rule is we don't want to um, adjust it by more than 90 minutes. So we, if we're getting up at seven o'clock, we may sleep in when we have that opportunity till about 830, but we don't want to sleep in till noon because it's going to mess up our circadian rhythms and make it more difficult to fall asleep that night. Um, so napping is a key strategy, having a good pre-sleep routine, as I mentioned, and this is, this is probably the number one complaint I see in um, especially professional athletes that I'm working with. They just have a hard time shutting down their mind. And so having a good pre-sleep routine where we set a bedtime alarm, the alarm goes off. Okay, it's time for me to start my routine. You know, about an hour before bedtime, we can start putting away those electronic devices we can start, you know, dimming the lights, potentially wearing blue light blocking glasses to block out that blue light, which tells our brain to be awake. Um, we can take a warm bath or shower. We can, um, you know, uh, write a to-do list right before bedtime to help offload those thoughts. So do some relaxing, stretching, breathing, that kind of thing. Um, so those, that's definitely a strategy, having a good pre-sleep routine that you can use at home or on the road. And then um, banking sleep is another one. So I briefly mentioned the um, study in the college basketball players, but there's that work has been replicated in cyclists, tennis players, rugby players, 
you know, so it really does work and it doesn't even have to be a huge period of time. Some of these studies are showing benefits of just two nights of more sleep um, leading into a competition and you'll be performing better. So those are some, some key strategies for coaches, practitioners, and athletes to think about. Cool. So can you discuss, uh, so can, can we like discuss a little bit more about like uh, sleep banking you mentioned? How does that work? Or is there like, like, is there like a duration a week or a month we should like be bank like how yeah how earlier we bank it it will work yeah um so that that basketball study was it was six weeks so i think it was five to seven weeks where they got on average almost two hours more per night now that seems a bit unrealistic potentially but there has been studies i think it was in um, um, tennis players where it was only a week of about an hour more per night. Uh, there was a study in cyclists where it was only three days, two to three days of an hour and a half per night, you know? So, um, of course we want to try and get more sleep because we think it can lead to better performance, but especially as you're approaching important competitions, playoffs, Olympic trials, you know, those kind of events, I would say, if you can start at least two weeks before the event and really try and bank sleep. So put sleep in the bank by getting more um, at night, whether that be going to bed a little bit earlier, maybe a half hour earlier, sleeping in a half hour, um, adding in a nap, uh, which can add to that bank as well. Um, and then, yeah, just really trying to focus on more sleep leading into those important competitions. Cool. The next thing I want to discuss is about like how sleep affects the brain wave. Mm -hmm. So is there like certain like, like duration or like, like deeper or like better quality going to affect it? And how does brain wave help us like recover? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we go through two main um, compartments of sleep. So we have non-REM sleep where it's non-rapid eye movement sleep. And that consists of lighter stages of sleep, for example, stage one, stage two, and then stage three is the deepest stage of sleep. So that's all part of non-REM. And then we also have REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, which is where we're typically dreaming. So you'll wake up in the morning from a dream um, and that'll be more of that rapid eye movement sleep. And so we go from non-REM into REM in about 90 to 110 minutes per cycle. And so we have multiple cycles of this. So we'll go from non-REM to REM, non-REM to REM, non-REM to REM. Um, of course, it can kind of vary, but that's how it generally works. And a lot of our deeper stages of sleep, that stage three non-REM is happening at the beginning of the night. So in the first half of the night, usually for the first four hours or so. But then as the night goes on, our REM sleep gets longer and longer and longer at the end of the night. And so that first REM period is really short. And then it'll kind of get longer with each cycle. Um, now, all of the stages are important. So I don't want to get focused in on, you know, why non-REM is important, why REM sleep is important. Um, non-REM is where that growth hormone is being released that helps repair our muscles, helps, repair, helps us recover from the day. Um, um, testosterone, it can be released in non-REM or REM sleep. And so um, most of what's happening during REM sleep is uh, a lot of memory con consolidation and also um, being able to learn a new skill as well is what we think is 
associated with REM sleep. So there's a lot of different, um, I guess, functions of each of these stages. But I think we can kind of get lost in the weeds a bit if we're thinking, uh, I want to increase my REM sleep or I want to increase my deep sleep. It's, it's, it's challenging to do. And so we just kind of got to think overall, okay, if I'm getting eight hours, I'm going to be getting all of the non-REM sleep, all of the deep sleep that I need, all of the REM sleep that I need um, to help recover from the physical and the mental demands of the sport. So, uh, like like you mentioned, if I don't have like an eight hour of sleep, I can take a nap, right? Yes, yes. So, um, uh, for example, if let's say there's uh, swimmers who have a early morning pool time that can't really be adjusted. Now, ideally, we want to start you know, there's been research to show the later that you start training, the more sleep the person gets. So ideally we want to hopefully eventually work towards starting training later, but of course there's limitations to that. So there might be only availability in the morning, for example. Um, and so in that case, uh, it's difficult to go to bed on time. So let's say I have to be to the pool at 6 a.m., um, you know, I got to get up maybe at 530 or five o'clock and then we subtract backwards from that. And then we're looking at a bedtime of 9 p.m., but it takes you time to fall asleep. So then, you know, if we want to get that eight hours, we have to get up at 5 a.m. You know, we'd really have to probably go to bed at 8 p.m. because it takes time to fall asleep. You may wake up during the middle of the night, et cetera. Now, trying to go to trying to have a teenager go to bed at 8 p.m. is it's just not possible, really, because melatonin, that sleepiness hormone, isn't being released until much later in the night because they're more of a night owl due to shift in biology. So we in that instance, you know, we want to go to bed as early as we can, but we're probably not going to hit that minimum mark each night. So then it's important to add in a longer nap opportunity, probably more like 90 minutes or so um, to make up for some of that lost nighttime sleep. So if what if what if if I go to bed early and just like couldn't go through the night, just keep waking up like every two or three hours. What is there a, a way to help like athlete go through the whole night? Well, my first thought would be, is there an underlying sleep disorder going on? So what is the reason that they're waking up during the middle of the night? Could it be um, sleep apnea, for example? Uh, are they drinking too much right before bedtime? You know, are they drinking too much water? Like, is that part of the issue? Are they having a big meal right before bedtime? So we have to kind of look at why they might be waking up. But of course, you know, we all wake up during the middle of the night. And so then we need techniques to help us fall back to sleep. And so I have kind of a middle of the night routine if I, let's say I have young kids, so if they wake me up or if I'm stressed out and I just wake up spontaneously, what I'll do is I'll do a breathing technique first. So I'll try and um, kind of relax. I'll do a breathing technique. So for example, uh, the four, seven, eight breathing where you breathe in for four seconds, hold your breath for seven seconds, and then breathe out for eight seconds. The important part is that you're breathing out longer than you're breathing in. And I do that four times. A variation of that breathing technique could be snake breathing, where you breathe in and then hiss out like a snake. And again, the important thing is that you're breathing out longer than you're breathing in. So I'll do a bit of a breathing technique first then I'll move on to a cognitive technique. So I'll do 
um, called the cognitive shuffle. I'll think of a word such as bedtime and I'll imagine all the objects I can starting with that first letter B. So bedtime B, ball, baby, bus, banana. I'll start imagining these objects. I'll move on to the next letter when I can't think of any more. E, eagle, egg, ear, and move on to the next letter. And then by the time, let, usually I'll be sound asleep, but there's been times where I haven't been able to fall asleep, even after I've done a breathing technique and a cognitive technique. Um, and then I will get up out of bed and only return back to bed when I'm sleepy. So one of the things we don't want to do is lay there in bed awake, wide awake for long periods of time. We want to get up out of bed and only return back to bed when you're sleepy. And so that's kind of an important element as well. And to come to the realization that, you know, we all have a poor night sleep here or there. Um, and especially before a game, sometimes that happens too, where you're anxious. And so if we can um, bank sleep leading into that game, you know, a poor night sleep right before is not going to have that much of an impact. Cool. Kind of want to circle back to like the breathing technique. Why is it so important that the time of exhale must be longer than time for the inhale? Really good question. It actually helps activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So that relaxation system. So when the exhale is longer than the inhale, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which helps us relax, um, you know, helps us just calm down, et cetera. So that's kind of the main point um, behind that. Cool. So uh, for athletes, they oftentimes need to like travel. They need to like uh, travel to different cities. So there's like different time zone. For like Olympic athlete or track athlete, they need to like travel for different countries. So there's also going to be different time zones. So uh, for your suggestion, how do like athletes adapt to like different time zones? Mm -hmm. I actually actually just posted a video on this on my Instagram. Um, so I'm at sleep for sport. So people can check that video out. Um, my husband was traveling to Japan for a ski trip. And my number one tip is to bank sleep leading into that trip. And the, I had this experience myself. I was, um, so there's a number of different techniques. We can do time light exposure. We can time our exercise. We can time our meals to help prepare for the time zone change. And so if we're traveling east, we would want to do things earlier. So we'd want to try and go to bed earlier, wake up earlier, get light early in the morning, shift our meals earlier in time, shift our exercise earlier in time, lock our light late at night, you know, at night as we approach bedtime. Um, and if we're heading west, we want to do the opposite. So we want to do things later, go to bed later, wake up later get light later, adjust our meals later, et cetera. So there's a bunch of different evidence-based techniques that we can use. And I actually followed these to a T on a trip I did to Switzerland from Canada. So I was traveling East, but the one thing I didn't do was um, get good sleep leading into that trip. And guess what? I had so much jet lag despite all of these fancy techniques, you know, wearing blue light blocking glasses in the middle of the day, um, you know, and exposing myself to light at different times of day. Yet I had a ton of jet lag. And the reason why is because I didn't get good sleep leading into that trip. So that's my number one tip. Now, I recently in September went to Greece and I, and this time I was like, okay, I'm going to get really good sleep leading into this trip. I'm going to do a few things that I can, you know, I was traveling East. So I exercised earlier in the morning. I tried to go to bed early, tried to wake up early, those kind of things. And my jet lag was 
hardly even noticeable. So um, that would be one of my big tips is to kind of get good sleep leading into the trip. You don't want to pull an all-nighter packing. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> I, I, I once heard a coach share the information about if there's like, let's say, if I fly from Taiwan to like the state, let's say there's like uh, 12 hours between that. The coaches said, I probably need 12 days to adapt. Mm. Like each each hour of time zone difference need a, a day to adapt. Is that a true thing? Mm, yes, good question. So typically when we travel east, it is a day per time zone to adjust. Although I think when, if we can, um, starting three days prior to the trip, you can start shifting your rhythms in advance. Um, when we travel west, it's actually a lot easier for us to adapt because our circadian rhythm is a bit longer than 24 hours for most people. And so to go to bed later is, is much easier because that's what our circadian rhythm wants to do. Um, and so for traveling west, it's more, more potentially a half, a half of uh, a half a day per time per hour of time zone change. Um, but I think with with strategies uh, preparing ahead of the trip, you can make that much faster. And then while you're at the destination too, if you, you know, expose yourself to more light, um, try and sleep on the time zone, your local time. Um, so trying to go to bed at a normal time when you're at your new destination, um, potentially having melatonin as well um, to take a few hours before the local time. All of those things I think can help speed up that process a bit. Cool, appreciate it. So uh, the next question would be for, I asked it for like uh, tons of my college athlete or some of my pro athlete just got out of college. And I also had this kind of like bad habit during during college is when I couldn't sleep, I probably just go to buy some beer or get <laughs> get, get wasted. <laughs> does that does that help or that that that's not going to be helpful? Oh, that's that's a really good question. Actually, I've had this question before when working with professional athletes. Actually, so it's not it's not a dumb question at all. You know, they're wondering. Um, so for example, this, this person, you know, they had issues falling asleep after the game and their question to me was, okay, do I stay up for two hours, two to three hours after the game, not being able to fall asleep, or is it better if I pound a few beers and help me fall asleep in under 30 minutes? And my response to him was, you know, we need, there are better ways to help us fall asleep than alcohol. So alcohol can, uh, of course it can make you fall asleep very quickly, but it's going to impair your recovery because it's going to disturb your sleep during the night as it's being metabolized. It's going to wake you up more often it can reduce that amount of REM sleep because it puts you in a lighter stage of sleep, um, lighter states of sleep. So any kind of noise can wake you up more easily um, when, we're, when we're having alcohol. Um, so having some of those, that good pre-sleep routine, um, even you know potentially supplementation, so magnesium, tart cherry juice, those can help us kind of get rid of that wired mindset. Um, and so having yeah, some of those really good techniques, uh, good pre-sleep routine, maybe even supplementation can help and create a better uh, sleep quality, a better recovery versus what we would get with alcohol. And I think, I think there's even been some research on alcohol and the impairment of 
muscle um, recovery as well. So it's not just about the impact on sleep, but also about the impact on you know, muscle recovery, for example. Great. So that's kind of like all the questions I have for today. So if there's like anyone are interested in what we're talking about today, where can they reach out to you? So I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter at sleep for sport. So sleep and then the number four sport. And then I have a website sleep into win.com. Um, and then I also, you can catch some of my work at cerebra.health as well. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.